L.O.K. Publishing presents Defender of Stone Untold Tales of Calda, Short Story 1 By Dan Zongeri and Robert Zongeri Introduction Untold Tales of Calda Throughout our rebranding of Tales of the Amulet we decided to make several collections of short stories. Untold Tales of Calda is one of three planned collections, followed by Untold Tales of Lorne and Untold Tales of the Dragon Wars. These three collections will focus on different aspects we've developed for the Legends of Calda universe spanning several thousand years and two different worlds. The original idea for this collection came about when cutting details from A Prince's Errand. That novel dives into a lot of ideas we had developed over the course of our early publications, The Dragon's Legacy, The Elven Secret, The Mage's Agenda, and their various companion stories, and was a culmination of years of world building. So, in order to not bog the story down with excessive description and too many side tangents, we decided to make individual stories with themes focused on one aspect of lore unique to Calda. The central themes for each are lightly touched upon in our main series, but these short stories explore them in greater detail. There are also other aspects of lore that weave their way into the stories and those often accent the main theme, i.e. Vavanak and Cherizium, or Mistralim and Tavisrals, or the Channels of Power and the Mages of Aleph. Each of these stories takes place in different settings, at varying times and places across the world of Calda. They feature different main characters, some which aren't even mentioned in the main series. So far, all of them take place before the events of a prince's errand. They are meant to be self-contained, and each has their own glossary to help the reader understand the terms used without getting into too much backstory. We intend to write 12 stories per collection. The initial five, plus Beneath the Frozen Wastes, our free gift for anyone joining our exclusive Readers Club, were all written during the time our editor went to work on A Prince's Errand. In the future, we plan to write more short stories while our larger works undergo editing. You can expect to see the rest of the Untold Tales of Calda collection release around the same time as The Dark Necromancer, Book 2 of Tales of the Amulet. After Untold Tales of Calda is released we plan to work on Untold Tales of the Dragon Wars between Elven Secrets and Treachery in the Kingdom. The final collection will coincide with the development of Book 7 through 9 of Tales of the Amulet, which works out perfectly because Lorne is one of the settings for those novels. This will give us ample opportunity to explore that setting and help flesh out details that are merely brief descriptions. When all 36 of these short stories are complete they will span a 7,000-year period across two worlds, covering multiple aspects unique to our fictional universe. Authors Forward Defender of Stone takes place a year before the events of A Prince's Errand and came about when delving deeper into Corner's background. In our prior works we never mentioned much about his children. We knew he had two daughters and a son, and his youngest daughter, Elista, was the only one ever mentioned by name. When writing A Prince's Errand we asked ourselves some questions about Corner, why didn't his son follow the family trade and become an adventurer? And why did all of Corner's children relocate to the city of Tor? Corner's nephew, Ordrith, is part of the adventuring band but not Corner's son. We didn't even have a name for Corner's son, at least not until after we named Corner's father. So, we made a sort of amalgamation of those names and came up with Melinar, Corner Nar and Meltes Mel. We then started thinking, what would Melinar do that might have some connection to the main series of Tales of the Amulet? We knew he lived in Tor, the reclaimed capital of the Western Sovereignty. But we needed a reason for Melinar to be in Tor. Corner and his wife, Karenna, often visited Melinar and his family when Karenna participated in the annual horse shows. This got us thinking about Tor. We had done some world building for a side series, Wanslinger, which takes place in Tor, so we used some of the information we discovered to build this story. But we still hadn't come up with something unique for Tor as a city. In our minds, Tor was just a dot on a map that was casually, and vaguely, thrown around in conversations between our main characters. Many of the other cities across Calda are known for particular things, Arbuth is a capital of fashion for both decor and attire. Aleth is renowned for its powerful mages. 
Mindolarn is known for its religious fanaticism. Keth has a reputation for pleasurable nightlife activities. Korath is a resort city with vast beaches. So what was the city of Tor known for? Art. We brainstormed various pieces of art that might have a prominent impact on our series and immediately came up with sculptures, particularly the Mistralims, or the Galustras as the elves call them. Read and find out if you don't know what either of those terms mean. The connections flowed and we had a clear vision of Melinar and his life. The plot soon coalesced and we had the story plotted, drafted, and edited within a week. It is the first short story we've written for Untold Tales of Calda and we hope you enjoy it. Dan Zongeri and Robert Zongeri Salt Lake City, 2020 Defender of Stone 6492 CD The City of Tor Melinar Dolsher was well known for his attention to detail. His meticulous nature was but one of many traits that had earned him his renowned reputation as one of the finest sculptors in the city of Tor. But even when he was a youth, many people claimed Melinar had a natural gift for refining stone. As a young boy, no older than four years old, Melinar had discovered his love for chiseling stone when his father built their family's country homestead on the western plains of Sorath, a large island in the Kalisher Ocean. One of Melinar's earliest memories was helping the workers hammer their chisels to shape the home's exterior walls. That was an impressionable moment that would forever shape his life. At some point during his childhood, Melinar didn't know when, exactly, he began scouring the fields outside his family's home to find large rocks. Together with his father, Melinar would chisel the rocks, making what his younger self deemed masterpieces of art. His father had kept many of those masterpieces over the years, and some decorated his father's study even to this day. Masterpieces, Melinar thought, laughing and shaking his head. My, how far I've come. He adjusted his grip on a riffler file, a tool used for fine sculpting. He stepped back, studying a true masterpiece towering in the center of his workshop. It was the likeness of one of the fathers of freedom, standing over twice the height of an average man. The statue was a representation of Melthes Dolsher, Melinar's grandfather. Melthes's likeness was made from white galstra, a granite-like stone with beige flecks and strata, and stood atop a knee-high pedestal chiseled from the same white stone. It wore exquisitely crafted armor befitting a general of the Western sovereignty. Two empty scabbards hanging from the statue's waist were also chiseled from the same galstra slab. Now this is a masterpiece, Melinar said, grinning. The statue stood in a heroic pose, chin lifted, gaze skyward. Melinar imagined his grandfather as bold, stalwart, and tenacious. He wanted to capture those traits, as Meltes Dolsher was one of the greatest heroes of the Western sovereignty. Not only were the statue's expression exhibited those traits. They were also conveyed in the figure's brawny physique. An uneducated eye might think the statue an exaggeration, but it was quite accurate. Not only had Melinar based his work on paintings, but he knew his father and grandfather shared the same brawny build. In many ways, Melinar felt he was sculpting a likeness of his father, Corner Dolsher. The resemblance is uncanny, Melinar mused, and then glanced to a painting upon which he based his sculpture's face. Both Melinar's father and grandfather had the same strong jawline. Their deep-set eyes were the same emerald shade, and their high cheekbones were identical. Still grinning, Melinar returned his focus to the statue. He was nearly finished with the masterpiece, all that remained was completing the detail on one of the scabbards. He had already polished the rest of the statue. With Riffler in hand, Melinar returned to the unfinished scabbard. When he was first commissioned by the overseers of historical preservation, they requested that he leave the scabbards empty. Melinar thought that odd. Then, they requested that Melinar separately sculpt the weapons meant for those scabbards, a serrated dagger and a short sword. That puzzled Melinar further. After all, this statue of Meltes Dolsher was to stand atop a pillar within the Great Wall of Osselgard, a grand barrier that surrounded the older parts of Tor. There was no place atop the pillar where the stone weapons could be displayed. 
Melinar deduced that they wanted the stone weapons inside the scabbards. But if the sculpted weapons were laid in the scabbards their fine detail would undoubtedly break from their own weight and pressure. Despite his concerns, Melinar sculpted the weapons separately as requested. Besides, it wasn't the first time he had replicated them. While Melinar refined the left scabbard, a knock resounded from the side door of the workshop. Melinar glanced to a nearby window allowing a view to the western parts of the city. Dusk was upon Tor, and the setting sun in the east glistened off the metal rooftops of several buildings. Another knock sounded at the door. I'm coming, Melinar shouted, stepping away from the statue. He strode across the workshop, Riffler still in hand. As Melinar reached the door, a faint conversation carried through it. He strained to hear the exchange, but the voices were too low. Melinar opened the door, finding a dark-haired woman dressed in a tan-colored lady's tunic and pants. She wore a dark blue cloak and cowl with golden embroidery along its edges that looked like tiny vines and flowers. That looks Losian, he thought, then eyed a large satchel resting against the woman's waist. The woman pursed her lips and studied Melinar with cold, sea-gray eyes. She didn't look pleased to be standing there. Your wife said you often don't hear when someone is knocking, the woman said flatly. That can happen when chiseling stone. She gestured into the workshop. May I enter? Melinar glanced beyond the woman, searching for his wife, Bedina. She was undoubtedly one of the voices he had heard before opening the door. But Vedina wasn't around. Your wife went back to the house, the woman said, gesturing with her head toward his three-story home with its steep, peaked roof. Like many artisans in the city of Tor, Melinar's workshop sat behind his residence. His workshop was probably larger than most, since many of his works were quite large. Luckily, the Teller district in which Melinar lived allowed for such accessory buildings. She said your dinner will be ready soon, the woman said, her tone growing impatient. I suggest we get on with the delivery. Her hand was still extended toward the door. Delivery? Melinar wondered, then glanced again to the embroidery on the blue cloak. Could this be the courier from Aleth? But he wasn't expecting the courier for at least a month. Why would Overseer Berlin send word to the mages ahead of my final report? During Melinar's latest report to the Overseers of Historical Preservation, it was mentioned that a courier from Aleth would deliver something to help protect the statue. They didn't explain what, though. Intrigued, Melinar's mind had raced with possibilities. During his schooling at the Kesarard, the most prestigious academy for artisans here in Tor, Melinar had heard stories of the pristine statues at the estate of Concorius Knowledge. Many accounts claimed that the statues had withstood the effects of weathering for over a thousand years. Some people claimed to viscerals, devices that channeled magic, were responsible for such preservation. Others said the statues were often repaired by mages using transmutative magic. Melinar thought that unlikely. He had a broader understanding of magic than most people, and he knew that the moment the mage ceased concentrating, the transmutation would crumble. But the use of Tevisrals seemed even more unlikely, as the supreme law of the Kingdom of Los, the nation where Aleth was located, forbade the use of Tevisrals. You're the courier from Aleth? Melinar asked. The woman rolled her eyes. Isn't that obvious? she demanded. Now, are you going to let me in or not? Melinar stepped aside, and the woman entered, now shaking her head. As he closed the door, the courier stepped across the workshop and studied the statue. Very impressive, she said. A befitting likeness for a Mistralim. A what? Melinar wondered, following the woman. She continued talking to herself, using strange words Melinar had never heard as she moved to a nearby worktable holding several tools, mallets of varying sizes, fine-point chisels, rasps, rifflers, and polishing cloths. The woman studied the table, then disappointedly turned back to Melinar. Do you have someplace that is clutter-free? she asked, gesturing to the worktable. Yes, Melinar replied, pointing beyond the statue. 
There's a spot along the far wall. The courier moved ahead of Melinar, rounding the statue. Once at the empty table, she set her large satchel upon it, then studied one of the reference paintings. At first glance one might think you egocentric, she said, as Melinar joined her. But I must admit, you do look like him. You're too young to be his son, a grandson, perhaps. Melinar nodded with a chuckle. Most people think I look like my father, he said. And my father looks like his father. Overseer Berlin claimed that as one of the reasons they wanted to commission me. They thought I might have an easier time than another when sculpting my grandfather's likeness. After all, I can draw inspiration from myself and my father. How fitting, she said with a grunt, then opened her satchel, revealing several glistening spheres. Melinar bent toward the satchel, gazing at the spheres. Those weren't to viscerals, were they? They couldn't be, he thought. An Alathian wouldn't violate their nation's supreme law. I suppose you weren't told what these are, the courier said, lifting one of the spheres from the satchel. Melinar shook his head. That is well, she said with a grin. The sphere was palm-sized and transparent, with tiny glistening specks. A thin golden frame encased the sphere, dividing it into thirds. Tiny inscriptions were scrawled all along the golden frame, but he could see that they were not the written characters of the common tongue. Where are the weapons you sculpted? she asked, grabbing an identical sphere. Wait, Melinar said, stepping between her and the path that led to the sculpted weapons. Before you do anything else, I need to understand what is going on. The overseers didn't mention anything about additions to my work. The courier looked even more displeased than when she was at the door. You wouldn't understand, she said, her tone condescending. Now please step aside and give me access to the weapons. If you add those to the weapons, they won't be accurate, Melinar said. You'll be destroying the aesthetics of its authenticity. Besides, the gem in the serrated dagger's pommel is triangular, not round. Step aside, she insisted, and show me to the weapons. Reluctantly, Melinar moved farther along the wall. He stopped at a solid table where the two oversized stone weapons lay. Impressive, she murmured, most impressive, the courier said something else that Melinar didn't quite understand but he thought she was remarking about the weapon's resemblance to their real-world counterparts. How could she know what they looked like? He wondered. The overseers hadn't any accurate depictions of Meltes Dolcher's weapons. Not many people were acquainted with them. Melinar's father had inherited the weapons after Meltes died, and then shortly thereafter relocated to Sorath. Melinar himself, however, was well acquainted with the stone weapon's real-world counterparts. Melinar's father had taught him how to wield both weapons, and when Melinar was thirteen he had made replicas of them, from stone, of course. But those replicas were not nearly as impressive as what lay on the table. Both stone weapons were two and a half times larger than the real weapons, and perfect replicas. Shortly after accepting the commission, Melinar asked his father to bring the weapons to Tor so he could take accurate measurements. The actual serrated dagger and short sword were shorter than a man's arm, the blades were barely the length of a forearm. But the stone replicas, if standing on end, would reach to a man's chest. In fact, the short sword looked like a thick claymore. What exquisite detail! The courier's tone had changed from condescending impatience to awed admiration. The blade's edges look so sharp, that is good. She moved the sphere in her left hand toward the serrated dagger's hilt. As you can see, it won't fit, Melinar said, pointing to the triangular indentation carved in the pommel. It was not quite half the size of the sphere. It is unwise to place a the rindar in the pommel, the courier said. A what? Melinar asked. For best results the optimal place is within the hilt near the guard. She glided the sphere along the stone weapon's hilt. The sphere was half the size of the hilt's thickness. Here, she said, hovering the sphere near the dagger's sinuous guard. So, what are you saying? Melinar asked, watching the courier ease the sphere toward the stone. 
you want me to chisel a hole in the hilt. That will weaken the integrity of the stone. It will. White light burst from the point where the sphere touched the stone weapon. The light grew brighter. Melinar shielded his eyes, squinting against the light. He could barely see the outline of the courier, pushing the sphere into the stone. Impossible. Soon, the light ceased. Melinar blinked several times, then noticed that the sphere in the courier's left hand was gone. It was as if the sphere had gone into the stone. But how was that possible? Unfazed, the courier moved toward the large stony hilt of the sculpted short sword. As with the serrated dagger, she guided the other sphere toward the guard and pressed it into the stone. More blinding light filled the workshop but dissipated after a moment. Melinar searched the courier's hand, but the second sphere had vanished like the first. By Helleron's trident. He cursed. The courier turned toward him nonchalantly. Am I safe in assuming you aren't finished with the statue? She spoke as if nothing out of the ordinary had happened. Melinar struggled to speak, and all he could do was nod. All right, the courier said inside, walking back to her satchel. Come with me. Mystified, Melinar watched the woman reach into her satchel once more. Well, don't just stand there, she said petulantly, removing another sphere from the satchel. This sphere was larger than the first two, about half the size of a man's head. I have other important things that need doing. Gathering his wits, Melinar walked back to the courier. Once you are finished, put this in the statue's chest, or anywhere else in its torso. This sphere, she emphasized, needs to be in a centralized location in order for everything to work properly. The courier eyed the tabletop, then glanced back to Melinar. This isn't made out of stone, is it? Melinar shook his head. Good, she said, setting the large sphere atop the table. Don't let it touch stone, unless you're putting it in the statue, of course. Now this, she rummaged through her satchel, needs to go into the pedestal. She removed a large disc the size of a dinner plate with the thickness of a hefty tome and set it next to the sphere. Unlike the sphere, the disc was made mostly of a strange, glistening white metal. Several transparent lines wrapped around its circumference. More strange characters were engraved on the metal parts of the disc, glowing a faint blue. The same goes for this. She tapped the disc. Don't let it touch any stone other than the pedestal. It must be placed last, do you understand? Melinar nodded. The courier closed her satchel and slung it over her shoulder. Now if you'll excuse me, I must take my leave. Keep up the good work, Mr. Dolsher. I'm sure our paths will cross again. With that, the courier hurried out of the workshop, leaving the door ajar. Dumbfounded, Melinar stared at the strange objects on the table. These couldn't be Tavisrols. Although he had heard plenty of tales from his father, they were unlike any Tavisrol Melinar knew of. But the disc was glowing, and when objects glowed, it often meant magic flowed through them. Why would they put Tavisrols inside a statue? Melinar wondered. It didn't make any sense to him. Shaking off his perplexity, Melinar returned to the unfinished scabbard. The courier's warnings repeated in his mind as he worked. Soon, only the lightstone lanterns lit the workshop. He worked until he was satisfied with the detailing on the scabbard. He ran his fingers across the scabbard's stony surface, studying the curve to make sure it was consistent. Good, he thought. Now all that was required was polishing. As Melinar placed the riffler on his work table, the side door to his workshop opened. I take it you're not hungry, his wife said, her tone not amused. Dinner, he bemoaned, guilt welling in his throat. Vedina stood in the doorway. Curly, sandy blonde hair hung down to her folded arms. Her thin lips were pursed and her pale brown eyes stared at him questioningly. The children and I have already finished, she said. She sighed once before continuing. I know you're almost finished with this statue, but I think you should pace yourself. If you work too hard you'll only burn yourself out. Melinar stared at her, 
blinking several times. How had he forgotten about dinner? Was he in shock over the incident with the weapons? Those questions gave him pause. Are you all right? Vedina asked. No, Melinar muttered, reaching toward a polishing cloth. His hand however, fell short. Vedina's demeanor softened, and she stepped into the workshop. Concerned, she caressed Melinar's shoulder. What happened? Unsure of what to say, Melinar did his best to describe the incident with the courier. To his surprise, Vedina hadn't seen the bursts of light even though many of the windows along the home's rear had a view of the workshop and its nearest window. Perhaps she had been in a different part of the house. Intrigued by Melinar's tale, Vedina eyed the table with the sphere and disc. They must be to viscerals, she said. But why, why would someone from Aleth hide to viscerals inside this statue? Though he had wondered the same, hearing the question only made Melinar wary of the answer. I think you've had enough excitement for one day, Vedina said. Come inside. You can resume in the morning. The following day, Melinar finished polishing the scabbard. Vedina watched him closely, curious to see the strange occurrence he had told her about the previous night. She had sent the children to a friend's house, concerned that something might happen when Melinar placed the strange objects inside the stone. Vedina always worried about things that were strange and unusual. After putting away his polishing cloth, Melinar grabbed the large sphere. Ever cautious, he picked his way through his workshop, warily eyeing his wife as he approached her. Be careful. Vedina nervously bit her lip. Melinar nodded, making his way to a ladder in front of the statue. Wait. Vedina called, coming beside him. Let me hold that while you climb. Melinar held out the sphere. While Vedina reached for it a creaking noise and a bang carried into the workshop and she flinched. Melinar lost his grip, dropping the sphere. No. Don't let it touch any stone, the warning rang in Melinar's mind. Panicked, he lunged toward the sphere as it fell toward the stone floor. Vedina whirled, gasping. As the sphere neared the floor, Melinar managed to grab it, but landed on his stomach. His fingers grazed the floor and the sphere nearly collided with his work table. I'm sorry. Vedina squeaked, her voice several octaves higher than usual. Melinar breathed deeply, easing onto his knees and elbows. Vedina began muttering anxiously, but Melinar's heart was thumping so hard that he couldn't quite understand her. Besides, her voice was still abnormally high. And you know how easily I get distracted when I'm worried. I shouldn't have. It's fine, Melinar interrupted. I should have held my grip. Come help me, please. She hurried beside him and grabbed the sphere. Vedina bit her lip again, her expression still anxious. After Melinar stood they exchanged tense gazes for a moment. Once they relaxed, as much as they could, Melinar resumed the task of setting the sphere and disc. He moved a stepping stool toward the ladder and reached for the sphere. Vedina handed it back, took a deep breath, and climbed the stool. Once she was atop it, Melinar eased the sphere back into her hands. He watched her for a moment, then climbed the ladder. The statue's chest was nearly twice as high as Melinar was tall. I level with the breastplate, Melinar turned to his wife, reaching toward her. Nervously, she handed Melinar the sphere, letting out a long breath as he took it. With the sphere in hand, Melinar studied the stone breastplate. He eased the sphere toward the stone, heart thumping. Though he knew a blinding flash would accompany the sphere's touch, he kept his eyes wide open. Melinar sucked in his breath as stone and sphere met. Blinding light erupted from the sphere, and Vedina screamed. Amid her shriek, Melinar shut his eyes and felt a tingling sensation along his hands and fingers, like a thousand needles gently pricking his flesh. Suddenly, his hands were pushed away and he felt the sphere no longer. Soon, the light faded. The sphere was gone. Easing against the ladder, Melinar studied the spot where the sphere had touched the stone. 
there was no sign of it. By all the gods of Kalda, Bedina muttered. Now for the disc, Melinar thought, climbing down the ladder. As he reached the table where the courier had placed the strange objects, Melinar noticed that the engraved characters on the disc were glowing a pale green instead of blue. Odd, he thought, grabbing the disc. Melinar returned to the statue. Vedina had moved the stool and ladder, giving him clear access to the pedestal between the statue's legs. What do you think is going to happen? Vedina asked. Though Melinar had his back to her, he knew she was biting her lip. The same thing, he said, bending toward the stone pedestal. Melinar eased the disc onto the stone, bracing himself for the blinding flash. But nothing happened. Confused, Melinar stepped back, stopping beside his wife. They watched the disc for a moment, then glanced to each other. Maybe you have to touch those glowing spots. Vedina speculated. Melinar shrugged, then noticed the pale green hue had changed to vibrant orange. Then, the stone around the edges of the disc liquefied. The disc sank into the stone, as if through mud. Once it disappeared completely, the stone settled, like a stilling pond, and then solidified. Now what? Vedina asked, studying her husband. How would I know? He pursed his lips and studied the statue of his grandfather. Nothing had changed. You said the overseers were bringing something to protect the statue, right? Vedina asked. Yes. Well, maybe it's protected. Maybe that disc thing is able to use transmutative magic, or something. Why don't you try polishing off an edge? Intrigued, Melinar grabbed one of his polishing cloths and moved to the pedestal. The statue was exactly as he wanted, and he didn't want to ruin it by testing a theory. So, he ran the polishing cloth back and forth across the edge of the pedestal several times, expecting to find dust-like debris. He found nothing. Odd, he thought. Use a riffler, Bedina suggested. Melinar narrowed his eyes at his wife, and she made several insistent gestures. Reluctantly, he grabbed one of his rifflers and moved to the back of the pedestal. At least that part wouldn't show. He grated along the edge, but no debris came loose. Well? Vedina asked. Nothing. Nothing, she blurted, moving around the statue. She furrowed her brow, her bewilderment painfully obvious. Well, it's definitely protected, Melinar said with a sigh. He picked his way past his wife to return the riffler to the work table. I'm going to rest. Shrill screams awoke Melinar. He tossed aside a thin blanket, leaping from the sofa where he had fallen asleep. Frantic cries echoed through the house, undoubtedly Vedina's. What now? Melinar thought, rounding the corner and dashing into the kitchen. Vedina was against the wall opposite the window that overlooked the rear yard and the workshop. With a trembling hand, she pointed to the workshop, frantically screeching incoherent nonsense. It, it, she muttered, shaking her head. It. Melinar wondered. Was she referring to the statue? When at the kitchen window one could see into the workshop through its nearest window. It, it moved, Bedina swallowed hard. The statue moved. Melinar glanced out the window, but saw nothing out of the ordinary. What do you mean it moved? Vedina continued shaking her head. Perhaps she saw something else moving, he thought, darting to the home's rear entrance. He kept a sheathed sword near the door, not that this particular part of Tor was prone to crime. Melinar was his father's son, and that meant having a weapon handy to defend his family. With sword in hand, Melinar bolted through the door, searching the yard. All was quiet. Nothing, he thought. The bushes and trees bordering the property were still. After determining that the yard was safe, Melinar hurried to his workshop. The door was closed and locked, just as he had left it. Melinar unlocked the door and hurried inside. He started upon seeing the statue. Meltas Dolcher's likeness was not at all how Melinar had left it. 
the statue had moved, and the stone weapons were inside the once empty scabbards. By Helleron's fins and scales, Melinar cursed, shaking his head. How had the statue moved? And the weapons, each weighed so much that one alone required five men to move it. He cautiously picked his way toward the statue. No longer was it gazing skyward. Instead, its head was tilted toward the door, and the expression on its face was no longer stoic. Impossible. As Melinar came within arm's reach of the statue, the workshop's door burst open. He spun, finding Vedina leaning against the doorframe. Don't, don't you, you see it? Melinar nodded. I do, but there's no way stone can move. Vedina's eyes widened and she staggered backward as a booming voice spoke from behind Melinar. I would disagree with that assertion. Melinar spun, drawing the sword from its sheath. Instinctively, he dropped into a battle stance, one of many his father had taught him. He frantically searched the workshop, but saw no one, and then Melinar saw the impossible. The statue's stony legs shifted. Melinar redirected his gaze, finding the statue of his grandfather staring directly at him, a broad smile forming across the stony visage. Don't be afraid, the statue said with that booming voice. I won't hurt you. My name is Meltes Dolsher. Though the words were deep there was something soothing to them. Vedina stammered, finally asking, how is that possible? The statue's face shifted as if pondering the question. Melinar, however, gawked at the now living statue. A moment of silence passed before the statue spoke. That is a complicated answer. You, Melinar stuttered, you can't be Meltes Dolsher. He's dead. I assumed as much, the statue said, frowning. The last thing I can recall is my preparations to go to Leyland Lake. The siege must not have gone well. The door slammed shut, and Melinar glanced over his shoulder. His wife crept through the workshop, her face contorted with fear and intrigue. She soon came beside Melinar, tightly gripping his arm. Please, the statue continued, don't be afraid. I know I am now a hunk of rock, but I promise I am gentle. What, what are you? Vedina muttered. The statue grinned once again, nodding his head. I don't know what they're called in common, but the lords of metal call them Mistralim. They. I mean I, am an embodiment of consciousness preserved by a combination of very ancient Tavisrols. The statue paused for a moment, averting his gaze. I never thought I would be immortalized like this. Melinar and Vedina started at each other in disbelief. A living immortal statue. And one that was once a man. But not just any man, Melinar's grandfather. The statue cleared its throat, then spoke once again. Now that you know who I am, it's only fitting you tell me who you are. I assume you are the man who sculpted me, or rather this body. What could he say? Melinar stood in silence for a moment. I understand, the statue said, this is all a lot to take in, N. My name is Melinar Dolsher. I am a sculptor here in the city of Tor. The statue's eyes widened, and it reared back. It really is alive, Melinar mused. For a short while the statue looked troubled. I am afraid to ask how long it has been since my last memory, it studied Melinar for a moment. Am I safe to assume that you are my descendant? Melinar nodded. Your grandson. The statue looked relieved. The emotion on the stony visage was unsettling. Then it's not been too long, the statue said. How are my children? C.O.R. and little Galana. He spoke as if referencing young children. Uh, they are well I suppose, Melinar answered. Father is retired and Aunt Galana keeps herself busy by taking care of her mother-in-law. Galana was always thoughtful, the statue said softly, its stony face looking as if it wanted to cry. But stone could not shed tears. Are they nearby? the statue asked. I would like to see them, before I embrace my fate. They're not here, Vedina said. They live in Sorath. 
Sorath, the statue asked, sounding disgusted. Melinar suddenly remembered his grandfather's prejudice toward the Mindalarn Empire and their allies. Meltaz Dolshir had a firm hatred toward the Mindalarnians, after all, they had subjugated Tor and the entire Western sovereignty through a bloody war. But times were different now, not many nations allied themselves to Mindalarn as they once had. Vedina ventured an explanation, but Melinar interrupted her. What do you mean by your fate? he asked. The statue turned toward Melinar. Mistralims are the undying protectors of the most sacred things on Kalda. Whoever commissioned you to create my likeness wants me to protect something. The statue then reached for his weapons, drawing them from their scabbards. At the statue's touch, both weapons transformed. What was once stone was now glistening metal. Both weapons looked identical to their real-world counterparts, to the minutest detail. Even the stone depicting the gems in the pommels was transformed. Oh, Bedina gasped, abruptly raising a hand to her lips. Amazing. Melinar thought, staring at the now metallic weapons. Quite incredible, I must say, the statue said, sounding intrigued. I've never seen such transformations. I wonder. The statue furrowed its brow, then the weapon burst with vibrant fire. The flames were undoubtedly magical in nature. I am destined to protect something, it mused. But you are to be placed atop the Great Wall of Osselgard, Melinar said. There's nothing sacred there, is there? The statue simply sheathed its weapons. The flames vanished, and the weapons returned to stone. Vedina quickly resumed her explanation, and soon Melinar joined her. The statue had many questions, as was to be expected. They spoke for hours, and Melinar did his best to recount his father's and his aunt's lives. A knock drew Melinar from the conversation with the statue of his grandfather. Melinar, Vedina said you were in here. May I enter? Though the door muffled the voice, Melinar knew it was Overseer Berlin. Why was she here? Had the courier notified her and the others of the delivery? One moment, Melinar hollered, then glanced back to the statue. Melthus's stony visage had resumed its original pose, and the weapons had returned to their scabbards. The sight of the statue resuming its stoic demeanor pleased Melinar. He had captured his grandfather's character. The door creaked open, and a mature woman with grey-streaked light brown hair entered the workshop. She was short and slender. Her face was wrinkled, but was probably once beautiful. I am impressed, Melinar, she said, gazing at the stilled statue. This is the epitome of grandeur. But I wouldn't expect any less after two years of hard work. Thank you, overseer. Melinar bowed. Belin picked her way across the shop, stopping beside the statue and its pedestal. She skimmed her aged fingers across the cool stone, nodding. This will do nicely. The overseer then turned toward Melinar. You have crafted a beacon of remembrance. Do you think you can make another? Another statue of my grandfather? Not of Meltaz, Belin said. We wish to have other statues commissioned. The rest of the Fathers of Freedom, starting with Candish Lausch. Would you be interested, Melinar? Melinar couldn't help but think of what the request implied. Would he be crafting bodies for more Mistralim, as Melthus's statue had called them? I would be honored, Melinar said. Very well, Belin smiled, then marched to the door. The council will want to meet, especially since this statue is finished. You'll be receiving a summons shortly. With that, Overseer Belin strode out of the workshop. Smiling, Melinar closed the door. Not only would he be known for his exquisite details, but Melinar would be the man who would bring forgotten heroes back from the grave. He would immortalize them not only as art, but as eternal protectors. And that was more satisfying than creating all the art in the world. The End of Defender of Stone Read more untold tales of Kalda in Conspiracy in Kildith Glossary A glossary of names, people, 
places, objects, and terms found in Defender of Stone. Pronunciations and brief descriptions or definitions included. Alath, Alath the city of mages located in the kingdom of Los. Alathian, Alathian the term for natives of Alath. Common tongue, the common language used among all human realms of Kalda. It is a language dating back thousands of years. Corner Dolshir, Kornar Dolshir Melinar Dolshir's father, a hardy warrior and adventurer who often scours the world for artifacts and to viscerals alike. Estate of Concorious Knowledge, the headquarters of the Order of the Mages of Aleph. It is a complex of buildings that sits on a mound within Aleph's heart, on a plot measuring 3,500 finials by 4,600 finials. It has four entrances, aligned with the four points of the compass. At its center is the main hall, surrounding it are the six schools of magic. Beyond the six schools sit the two halls for the master's wing, the acolyte dorms, two dining halls, and two buildings dedicated to non-magic study. Near the east and west entrances of the estate are armories and graduate dorms for agents and protectors of the order. Near the north gate is a grand gathering hall, capable of sitting thousands. Near the southern entrance is a stable and earthen mound, the last for transmogrified steeds. Not far from the same gate is a grand courtyard with a seven-tiered fountain. Fathers of Freedom, the, a group of men who started Tor's rebellion against Mindelarn's tyrannical occupation of the Western sovereignty. Galana, Galana Melinar's aunt, his father's sister. Galana was the youngest child of Meltaz and Ilana Dolsher. Galstra, Galestiara a stone variant of granite with flex and strata running through the stone. It is often grey but there are semi-rare quarries that produce white and beige. Great Wall of Osselgard, Ozielgard the circular wall that surrounds the pre carthur Empire parts of the city of Tor. The Great Wall was built thousands of years ago and rises seven stories. They have military fortifications built within them, as well as massive alcoves. Those alcoves once held the statues of ancient heroes from myth and legend, but shortly before Melinar's time they had since been replaced by the tyrants of the Mindolarn Empire. The statues of the tyrants, however, were destroyed after Tor regained independence, and those alcoves stand empty. Helleron's fins, hell you are on a cursed some Chaldean swear. Helleron's scales, hell you are on a cursed some Chaldean swear. Helleron's trident, hell you are on a cursed some Chaldean swear. Kalda, Kaldiah the name of the world. Kalishir Ocean, Kaliishir an ocean covering most of the southwest hemisphere of Kalda. Kandish Laush, Kandish Loosh a prominent merchant from Tor. One of the fathers of freedom. Kesarard, Kesuarard an acclaimed school in Tor for artisans. Kingdom of Los, the largest of three powerful nations on Kalda, the others being Kildath and the Western Sovereignty. After the fall of the Carthur Empire, the kingdom ruled all the Chaldean mainland until the ninth king divided the borders, establishing a new Kildath and the Western Sovereignty. Since then many other nations have sprung from each of the three countries. Established by Doran, the mage king, Los has been a peaceful realm devoted to protecting all humanity. Leyland Lake, Leyland a Tavisral crafted reservoir within the Mindalarn Empire. Lords of Metal, the ancient draconic rules of the council called, the Rilsha. Losian, Losian a term for any native of the kingdom of Los. Melinar Dolshir, Melin Ahr Dolshir an acclaimed stonemason in the city of Tor, the son of Corner and Karenna Dolshir. Meltas Dolshir, Melthas Dolshir one of the fathers of freedom, a skilled fighter and head of Tor's elites, during the years 6443 CD to 6453 CD. He was the father to a son and daughter, Corner and Galana. Melt has died during the siege on the castle of Leyland Lake, in 6453 CD. Mindolarn Empire, Mindolarn an empirical nation along the southwest shores of the Chaldean mainland. Founded by Mindolarn Medivar, the first and his six brothers in 6360 CD. Misthralim, Misthralim Draconic for Living Statue. Overseer Belin, B. E. H. Lin the leader of the overseers of historical preservation. 
Overseers of Historical Preservation, a civil organization of the city of Tor responsible for preserving various aspects of history. They manage museums and libraries and are also responsible for restoring the city of Tor to its pre mindalarn occupied state. Sorath, Sorath a city and island that share the same name in the southwestern sections of the Kalishar Ocean. Teller District, Tel Ahr an affluent district in the city of Tor. Tevisral, Tvisral any device capable of manifesting or channeling magic. Darindar, Darandar a Tevisral and critical component a Mistralim. The rindars are ancillary tevisrals that connect accessory pieces for a misthralim, particularly weapons. They are responsible for managing the shift from stone to metal, and produce a bond that makes the weapons impervious to destructive forces, particularly magic. If an existing weapon is coded to a the rindar, the the rindar is able to replicate those properties. Tor, the capital of the Western Sovereignty, one of the oldest cities in the human realm. Transmutative magic, a type, or channel, of magic that changes the composition of physical matter from one state to another. Vedina, Vedina Melinar's wife, a native of Tor who has curly sandy blonde hair and pale brown eyes. Western Sovereignty, one of the oldest nations of men on Calda. Its capital is Tor, and during Melinar's time its borders consists of the western coast of the continent known as the mainland, the river of Torland, the mountains south of Gastrim, and the rivers of Caladris and Porgifer. In ancient times, the Western sovereignty also included the nations of Caladorn, Gastrim, and the Mindalarn Empire. About the authors Dan Zangari is the creator of the Legends of Calda Fantasy Universe, a work in development since the early 1990s. He received a Bachelor's of Science in Aerospace Engineering from the University of Southern California and a Master's Degree in Systems Management. His love for science fiction and fantasy prompted the creation of this fantasy universe. When he's not writing he enjoys reading, watching movies, spending quality time with family and serving in his local church congregation. Robert Zangari is the co-author of the various books which belong to the legends of Calda Universe. He studied biomedical engineering at the University of Utah, however, his love for stories and storytelling took him down a different career path. When he's not writing he enjoys spending time with his wife and daughters, playing video games, practicing martial arts and immersing himself in a good story. Other titles by Dan Zangari and Robert Zangari For an up-to-date list of publications, visit the official Legends of Calda website, http colon slash slash www.legendsofcalda.com slash books.html Published by L.O.K. Publishing Tales of the Amulet Novels A Prince's Errand The Dark Necromancer Elven Secrets The Mage's Agenda Treachery in the Kingdom The Red Ruby Companion Stories a Thief's Way The Last Barginist Mysterious Assassin Return of the Elves A Forgotten Hero Guardians of Calda Untold Tales of Calda Defender of Stone Conspiracy in Kildith Thieves Among Nobles Sorter of Mages The Price of Penitence Beneath the Frozen Wastes Novels Coming Soon a King's Fate. The Golden Dragons. Reign of the Black Knight. Companion Stories Coming Soon. A Knight's Honor. Crown of the Cavern Lands. A Legend Reborn. Connect with the Authors. Exclusive Readers Club. HTTP colon slash slash www.legendsofcalda.com slash newsletter dot html. LOK Publishing's official website www.legendsofcalda.com Twitter https colon slash slash twitter.com slash legendsofcalda Official Facebook page https colon slash slash www.facebook.com slash legendsofcalda We hope you've enjoyed this production of Defender of Stone by Dan Zongeri and Robert Zongeri. Text copyright 2019 by L.O.K. Publishing, 
LLC. Production Copyright 2023 by LOK Publishing, LLC. All rights reserved.